Thanks for listening in to another episode of RNT Fitness Radio. This week, Akash and I have on one of our coaches, a guy called Nathan Johnson, that we both worked with in London. So on a personal level, I've always got on very well with Nathan, um, to the point I even went to Vegas with him last year. And on a professional level, both Akash and I have kind of watched him uh, like climb up through the ranks over the years and churn out some pretty amazing results, uh, especially most recently. So uh, this week we decided to get him on for a call and kind of get his take on things. He has a background in sports therapy. Um, he he isn't blessed with um, you know particularly lean genetics. So he's not one of these freaks that you see on Instagram that just has a six pack year round. He's like you and I. You know he has to work hard for it, and he he actually touches on sort of the first uh, attempts at dieting that he did, the mistakes that he made, and how overcoming those has helped him really get into his clients mindsets and be able to empathize with his clients so for those of you that are perhaps struggling with adherence this episode should be a really good one for you guys i hope you enjoy okay so for the listeners out there talk us through it who who is nathan you know what got you into the fitness industry how long have you been in the industry now give us a rundown of that um, so at the moment, I'd probably say Nathan Johnson is a hired hitman in terms of just getting results. Um, oh, I, I like know. it. I like that. <laughs> You've been thinking about that, haven't you? I actually have that. What is it? I the rest of them and I'm like, do you know what? It's it's time I get something right. Yeah, so, fuck, you nailed that's that. That's a good one. Nice. No, I like it. So, I had, you know, what, so sorry to interrupt, but you know when Fucking I go... Assassin. To, sorry, carry on. <laughs> you know when we go to those, when I go to that BNI, they said you should have a tagline for what you do, right? And I always thought, I always say just like transformation specialist or whatever, but that's a good one. Yeah, yeah. hired hitman. I like that. Hired yeah. hitman for results. Yeah, yeah, very anyway, good. Like, Akash is going to steal that next. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> no, he, he's, <laughs> it's going to be uh, in my bio now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I like that. Sorry, carry on. Cool. Um, so yeah, currently I'm just hitman for hire in terms of results, getting great transformations. Um, you know, as well as uh, working at a gym in London and trying to develop the business side of things uh, for them. Um, so that's that's kind of good. Um, Nathan is uh, been in the industry about five years. Um, so I was a bit of a jack of all trades at the beginning. So I had the sports therapy degree. Uh, basically, I did some work with the rugby team. I did uh, work with my like, schools, uh, everything in terms of injury management, prevention, strength and conditioning. And then I got myself a first PT job in Canary Wharf. And from there onwards, I kind of just escalated up the ladder to various different places uh, where I find myself now and just kind of get results on a consistent basis. My, my level of knowledge is still improving. And the way I deal with clients is it gets them better as we go. Perfect. So what, what made you uh, go down the, the fitness route? Like what twigged? What made you want to do this as a career? Oh, I was, um, I was doing a BTEC in sport and I actually failed it. Okay. Um, so I wanted to be a physio originally, um, and just generally I wasn't clever enough to be a physio when back in school and back in uh, college. So yep. it led me down doing a diploma, um, and that kind of like got my interest in various aspects of health and fitness. And uh, from there, that kind of spiraled onwards. So you got into the into the fitness industry that way, and yep. you you qualified um, with a background in sports therapy. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you're qualified PT and you've got a background in sports therapy. Yeah. So how, how has that carried over to like uh, training your day-to-day clients? Oh, massively. Um, anything from looking at uh, biomechanics, weaknesses, um, tightnesses, range of motions, all these different types of things that you can look at to assess clients' um, capabilities, should we say. Um, it allows you to kind of cater your exercise selection, programming to those type of things. But actually the most important thing that I found is that you can call a lot of bullshit out on various clients because you know that their mechanics better than they probably do and their limits um, by just having you know an assessment or just a criteria of things that you're looking for. Um, mm-hmm. And you can really go to them and just say, actually, you can do better or you can call them out in various aspects in terms of exercise execution, um, you know, the, how they've the been fake injuries. Like, yeah, exactly. Oh, I oh, oh, can't, can't do today because I've got a, a knee injury. Oh, well, we can do a body. Oh, let's, let's, what type of knee injury? Yeah, what, exactly. Where is it on the knee? Yeah, is it yeah, flexion yeah. extension? Yeah, we can still yeah. do something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah you still get a dumbbell pressing. You can still bicep curl. You know, you yeah. still get something. So, let's be honest, right? My posture is terrible. My posture kind of like matches what most of our clients uh, walk in the doors at, which is the reason for my poor chest development. 
we've mm-hmm. said it time and time again, strong presser, no chest development because my shoulders are rounded off. So for a lot of the, the male listeners listening to this, trying to grow their chest and struggling, if, if you are helping me one-to-one, what would be your three bits of advice in terms of stuff that I, I probably know that I should be doing, but obviously I'm too lazy to do it. Um, but if somebody was uh, a little bit more disciplined, what would be your three uh, go-to bits of advice for sort of opening up the chest, getting into the pec fibers? Uh, it would be firstly probably working towards uh, what rib cage angle you have. Um, so with, with the pecs aligned on the rib cage, um, at different angles, you can kind of manipulate your rib cage angle to get more out of your pecs than, than maybe your shoulders. Mm-hmm. Uh, so How would you do that? Uh, set various different bench heights. So, oh. yeah. Can you, give us example? Can you break it down for the layman? Well, I, I'm going to give an example here, actually, that, that I, I only noticed last week when I was watching one of my videos back, and maybe this is where Nathan is going with this. So, Akash, what's the part of my chest visually that lacks? Upper chest. Upper chest, right. What do I always do? Flat. No, I always do incline press. When, oh. when, did, when did you last program? <laughs> you, you programmed for me. You when put, did you? You, you put poor, I saw you doing pause presses today. Oh, that's only because um, I couldn't do the floor press because the rack was used. Oh, okay, got it. Okay. Yeah, that's the only time. No, other okay, than that, yeah, it's always it's either low incline low dumbbell or it's my uh, mid yeah, incline yeah. barbell yeah, press, yeah. right? That you've programmed in for me. Today was just an anomaly. Um, so I was watching one of my videos, right? Now, uh, I'm trying to think of the way of wording this. Obviously, I would try and give you diagrams of my hands, but then the listeners can't see it. But basically, when I first started UP, um, we all knew that I, I, you know, I benched my shoulders. So one of the big bits of advice that Akash gave was to put an arch in my back, um, dig the, you know, drive the shoulder blades down, drive the chest into the air. Did get into the pecs. However, I carry that over now, obviously, to when I incline press too. But when I was watching my video the other day of me incline pressing, when I put this arch into my back, because of the shape of my rib cage, it actually looks like I'm flat pressing. Mm-hmm. Do you see, have yeah. you seen this before? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've we've had conversations before about um, when we were looking at your pressing uh, back at uh, UP, and you know that that rib cage angle for you is a massive important factor, as well as not to mention your massively tricep and shoulder dominant, um, which you're gonna you'd have to get out of if you wanted to develop that chest further. Yeah. So, what would be your what would be your favorite remedial exercises to try uh, and for someone that was like um, shoulder and tricep dominant would be kind of feel that chest first. So whether it's a pre fatigue of something in the shortened position or like a banded, um, it's hard to explain just by words. But you know, just either just pushing your hands together, sque- squeezing that chest, pre exhaust it. You know, get a feeling in there first. Uh-huh. and then that can transfer over. The more neurological connection you've got to an area, the more you probably can contract it and feel it and then use it. So that'd be yeah. the equivalent of putting your arms out in front of you and then squeezing them together, right? Yeah, yeah. Squeezing your hands together. So yeah. Or like, like a classic, like a, like a kid doing like a muscle pose. Yeah. You know, yeah. Like a three-year-old kid that's trying to show off to his dad, that sort of pose, but you squeeze yeah. your hands together. So you do that before you set or? Well, it depends. If you do it for too long, obviously, then that's going to hamper your performance. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, if you do it at the beginning of your, your exercise or beginning of your total program, you can just kind of get some feeling in there and then go and do about your day. So that's what I do when I, before I do up body, I do, um, I do those, uh, handcuff drills that I do, you know, the YTW kind of thing. And then I superset that with, um, 10 second holds of just squeezing my pecs. Mm-hmm. I do those two twice and then I'll start my, uh, dips or floor presses or whatever, yeah. whatever the workout is. It's interesting stuff with that, um, creating like a neurological connection and there's loads of stuff on the carryover of like if you do an isometric contraction within different ranges of like say for instance if we're doing a bench press before you go into your actual bench press yeah. you get bigger strength increases i yeah, think yeah. i don't know the angle but you get a carrying angle so you know you do it at 90 degrees I think it's about 10 15 degrees I think. Yeah, yeah yeah so you get stronger at various different ranges and therefore that can carry over to your uh, your bench pressing so that that isometric thing is is it's very good. I do that for leg curls as well. So I'll kind of, I'll flex my hamstrings for like mm-hmm. 10 seconds in between warm-up sets just yeah. to get a connection. And then before I move on to quads, in the, in the first two warm-up sets, I'll just squeeze my quads for about eight to 10 seconds just to kind of get that connection yeah. uh, during the warm-up sets. I won't do it before my main sets because that'll take away from performance. In the warm-ups, I think it really helps establish that mind-muscle connection for sure. Yes. So that when yes. you move on to your heavy loads, you can overload the right muscles. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we're, so we're, so we're focusing on like creating a stronger neurological connection to the, to the weak area that we've got. Mm-hmm. And then what about like for the upper back, for example? Um, obviously, Akash is a fan of like the YTWs. Are you a fan of those? Have you got any drills that you would uh, recommend for listeners if they've got, you know, what I've got with the, the whole internally rotated shoulders? 
Yeah. The weak upper back. Yeah, and the other one is, um, so I'd probably say, yeah, and anything to do with scapular retraction or depression is going to be good. Another one is uh, like the long head of the tricep. If you can activate that and stabilize that, that's another shoulder stabilizer. So okay. most pe- most people that have these rounded shoulders can't stabilize the scapula, otherwise it wouldn't be forward or the, the glenohumeral joint wouldn't be forward and rounded. Which, which could perhaps be why I can close grip bench press 120, 130 kilos, but I can't do a PJR, a PJR pullover for more than like, 24 kilos yeah maybe your triceps because, are um, actually stabilizing your shoulder as opposed to what's supposed to be stabilizing yeah your this is what akash and i found out he's what what weight are you using for the pjr at the moment I'm akash to, uh 45 now yes yeah, so he's on 45 kilo pjrs and i'm on like 26s last week yeah <laughs> like it's and it's a huge difference right yeah yet yeah, what would you be able to close grip bench press uh, 80 <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, no realistically it'll probably be around what maybe 90 like, no what for what how many reps so we're going like eight reps no, nah, about 100, 105. No, nah, he couldn't. He's yeah, lying. No, no, that's to the really listeners out there, he's like, yeah, close grip, that, close grip four plus 800 for eight at the end of the workout. What'd you do? 100 for eight at the end of a workout with a pause on every rep. Oh, okay. Yeah. What, close, what, close, it, a close, close grip, grip press? Really? Close grip press, yeah. 100 for eight at the end of the workout. Oh, okay. I'm catching you up, boy. <laughs> he's, he's, he's trying. He's trying. Um, so where was I going with this? So yeah, so you could be right there. It could be that uh, the long head that are the the tricep is holding me back. Um, Akash has been ho- hypothesizing this for ages with any overhead work I do. I'm so weak at it comparative to any you know, normal, like when the elbows with the midline of the body. Yeah. So Nathan, um, why would you, why would you want to activate the long head of the triceps then? Cause you, so I was saying, I wasn't saying that it was holding him back. I was saying that maybe it would be a, for him at the moment is a, the shoulder stabilizer. So he's uh, stabilizing his shoulder with the long with head. The, yeah. With the long head. Yeah. yeah. Is, um, Instead of using the retractors, retractors, the retractors yeah. et cetera. Lats, okay. maybe. Um, so that when he goes into an overhead position, obviously the long head and is put into a position of work, yeah. but you can't work and stabilize at the same time. Yeah, like that makes sense. And that probably explains why he's also weak at chin ups, right? Or any overhead pulling. Yeah, because it's the same. It's the same motion. You know, because you it's it's pull, the long pull head. Pull downs are the same as like a, a shoulder press. In the same motion, you can't if you can't dumbbell shoulder press up straight with a full range of shoulder flexion, you can't do a pull. A, a strict pull up either but also um the long head of the triceps is going to assist in that motion as well right yeah it goes into extension yeah yeah so if, if that's not firing at all then he's not gonna he's he's yeah. not gonna be at his maximum strength right i think the uh, the good analogy is you can't shoot a cannon from a canoe pull check yeah yeah nice i like that um I see Akash smiling there. How did you get that one? I know. How did you get so quick? Do you know how? Because uh, Nick Daniel put it on Instagram like two days ago. Classic. <laughs> I think he spelled check wrong as well. <laughs> <laughs> I think he spelled S H E C K. Um, hence why it stood out to me, which is why I thought I'd get in there before Akash and impress you guys. I knew it when actually, if you just, if we'd have recorded this a week ago, I wouldn't have had a clue. I thought it was Charles who said that, but okay. No, apparently Paul check. Okay. Anyway. Um, so that's right. Yeah, uh, got, okay. Let's go to like, another. You've got my muscle connection and then you've got the stabilizing the upper back. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's move on to uh, another muscle group that sucked for me just because my, m- a lot of my issues, other people can relate with. I've got really bad posture for a trainer, but it kind of is quite common in the average person. So how about biceps? Mm-hmm. What would be your, you know, again, because I'm typically rounded off. Like what I've found that works for me is um, keep my elbows behind the midline of the body. So I don't know if you saw, but I, I lean against like a preacher curl bench now and my hips away from it. Um, I do this like hybrid uh, EZ drag curl where I curl it normally. And then on the eccentric, I pull my elbows behind my body. What are the tips uh, for people struggling to bring up their biceps? Um, yeah, would I'd, you would you advise? I'd, uh, I'd definitely go with support like you're doing there. Support is the biggest one. So if you can support yourself either by your elbows uh, like a preacher curl or something like standing against a wall or something, some variants. I mean, people are coming up with fit, uh, fancy stuff at the moment with using barbells that like you push your elbow against and then you bicep curl. That's pretty decent. That's more stability so that you can produce more force. Okay. Uh, without stability, you can't produce force or you're limited in your force production. Um, so stability or gaining stability uh, is one. Um making sure that the wrists aren't being used and um, in terms of general part clients, how, you see them like all the curling time. the wrist towards yeah. you and using the forearm flexors. Yeah. Absolutely. If we're talking general pop, that, that's, that's the first thing, you know, A to B type of, uh, throw the weight regardless of its wrist, whether it's the, the elbow joint or shoulder joint. So, yeah, uh, so, so somebody listening here, 
the point Nathan's making is keep your wrist neutral the whole way up through the curl, right? Try and resist that temptation of bringing your knuckles towards the shoulder. Yeah, like yeah. just grip it real tight so you, you have no choice to move the wrist. Okay. Anything else on the, on the uh, biceps? Um, and yeah, again, just make a, make a good connection with it. Try it in various different positions. Everyone's going to be different and have different stabilities, different shoulder girdles. Um, so, you know, for you, you wouldn't, you don't know if you fit different exercises. Like for loads of people, standing barbell bicep curls don't fit in terms of the like carried angles, in terms of shoulders and elbows. So, you know, find an exercise that's, that's right for you, that you can feel, that you can load appropriately and then progress with. Perfect. I like it. Um, let's do one more of these before we move on. Let's uh, let's balance out and uh, let's go down the like the female route now. So let's be honest. It's twenty eighteen. Uh, everyone loves like you know an ass selfie in the mirror. Uh, what what are your go to? Give us your three favorite exercises for um, for these girls that like to take photos of themselves holding their tub of sponsored branched chain amino acids. Oh, cool. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, first one has got to be the hip thrust. Um, I think it just generally because it puts it in a shortened position and you can load it really heavy. I think I'm going to choose exercise that you can load appropriately as well. Great. Same um, wavelength as Zakash and I. Yeah, always. Um, and then just you're stable. You can produce force and you can do it in so many different ways. Banded, kettlebell, dumbbell, barbell. Um, and you can load it in very different rep ranges. I think that's why it's so versatile. Um, and it can be changed for individual ranges of motion. So obviously if you don't have a lot of range of motion around the hip or you can't do much hinging because you're rubbish at hinging, you can kind of change the angle of the bench that you're sitting on um, to create smaller or bigger inclines in your That hip. might be the one exercise that I never really give to males. Yeah, I, I, I don't I give it to males. I never program it to, to men, right? Do you? I, I would only do it if they run out of options. Yeah. Uh, and general pop like uh, general pop clients you'll yeah, find that dumbbell hip thrust when we used to pt used to be a popular one yeah it's and um, it's you know you can produce yeah. intensity force and you don't have to have that much upper body control compared to something like a sumo or, or a but, but if we're talking intermediate listeners that are listening to this as a dude unless you're like getting on stage and you've you've actually got weak glutes and you're going to compete then for the average person wanting to just get jacked yeah. as, a, as a male it's like the problem with the exercise is such an awkward one to set up, right? Especially when you you can lift quite a bit of weight. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's good. It does work. You just don't make eye contact. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the big one. Um, okay, two two more exercises for uh, females trying to bring up glutes and hamstrings. Uh, sumo deadlift, for sure. Yeah. Um, just, again, you can load it. It's in the mid-range. Um, and then probably the last one... Um, people that are struggling to feel their glutes is probably like a frog bridge, which is where obviously you've got your feet, uh, your palms of your feet, if you call them that, um, pushed together so that you're in a really wide position like a frog. And then you're pushing your hip, uh, feet together. Is this so you've got the external rotation element in as well? Yeah, yeah, you've got that and you can either do that um, elevated. It's just kind of a more of a... Um, I'm, on, I'm on fire today, yeah, aren't I? Yeah, you, <laughs> I can you, see you, Akash you, grinning. Big, big words. Yeah. Um, it's because you can, we never talk about training now. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> now I'm hearing Adam say flexion, extension, external rotation. I've been reading my anatomy book before we got on the call. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that, that's just a good one for maybe uh, some priming movements just to be able to feel it and then go and do your heavy stuff afterwards. Perfect. Akash, anything that you would add to either three of those scenarios? So for the, well, the chest for the, development, for the bicep <laughs> development, and now for the uh, glute development? For the glutes, I'd, I'd probably add that... Um, most women have really tight hips, especially the hip flexors and quads. So it's always worth stretching and mobilizing that before doing any glute work, mm -hmm. especially women that sit down a lot and wear a lot of high heels. Yeah. Mm -hmm. they'll, they'll be typically very tight in the quads and the hip flexors. So you may want to stretch those out before doing any glute work. Yeah. yeah. And for people with um, chest and bicep issues, I think one exercise that, that helps with both is uh, band over and backs. Yeah. I think you, but I think you need to do those daily. Yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll, just, we'll just leave it at that. I think you need to do it daily 30 <laughs> to 50 times at least. I think I've seen real good improvements with people that have done it, but it's a matter of sticking with it for at least a month. Is that a dig? Yeah, that is. <laughs> <laughs> I think that really helps though because you're going to open up the shoulder, you're going to help them up the front of the shoulders, the pecs, and the biceps all at once. And yeah. you're going to strengthen the rotator cuff because as you're pulling the band apart over your head, you're going to, there's some outward force which uh, works the rotator cuff. You're killing like four birds with one stone. 
Yeah. I like it. Okay, so uh, moving on away from kind of like exercise biomechanics, let's talk biofeed. What is it with these big words today? Biofeedback. <laughs> um, sorry, this one's coming from Akash. I'm, I'm reading this one. This, this hasn't come from, from my noggin. Um, what biofeedback should clients be uh, looking for and paying attention to when they're training that they can then relay back to their online coach? This is specifically so, for online so, training. Yeah, yeah. Okay. so, so for, for example, for, for RNT clients listening to this, um, what sort of biofeedback should they be listening to that they can on their weekly check-in say, Oh, by the way, Nathan, by the way, Akash, by the way, Adam, specifically to their training. Okay. Yeah. In the gym. Um, so in, in terms of the training, I would say always even training nutrition would be like stress and digestion, sleep, um, adherence to a plan. Okay, so wait, the, way, the way I wanted to go with this question is, the one thing we miss out with online training is you can't, you don't get that real time feedback as you do with say PT, you know, you're correcting them as you go along, okay. you've cues as you're speaking to them. So if you're, if you're an online client doing an exercise in the gym and, and it's not quite feeling right, what should you be looking out for? Well, the first thing before Nathan answers, I'm going to tell them to reread their first email and check out our, ex- <laughs> check out our exercise library. Just so I plug that cause uh, we did spend a lot of time on it. Now, now on to Nathan. <laughs> Um, I would definitely say the first first one would be to uh, even before biofeedback because the, they may not even have biofeedback because they don't know if it's right or wrong. Yeah. Um, but you got to video your exercises, at least your yeah. sets, uh, one set maybe of every exercise, maybe a top set. I think that's the first thing because ultimately people don't have that biofeedback yet. It, it maybe even at intermediate level they've been going on on it for two years following programs here there and everywhere and as we know even at an intermediate level people are getting things wrong well, well no, wrong, that's a good point because i still video my top sets on my main exercises like every week when i do an rdl if it's a if it's a new weight or even if it's the same weight i just video it just to make sure that the depth is the same or that nothing's going wrong when i'm going down in the rep or so yeah. i think no matter what level you're at videoing your exercises is is critical yeah and, and then and like adam said earlier on he, he found out you know when he was doing incline pressing that he's actually turning into a flat press but he wouldn't know that if, if he didn't video it, right? Yeah, because I, you know, I, in my head, I'm like, yeah, I feel it in my chest. Um, but it's not until I watch the video back that I'm like, oh, the angle of my humerus, <laughs> 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 the angle of my arm um, compared to my, uh, my torso is just, it is just, it mimicked a frat press despite being on a 45 degree angle. And it's because of the, the excessive arch I was putting in my back and the shape of my rib cage. Um, so now I'm guessing for me, I have to flatten my back slightly on that. Yeah, it depends on, again, you can work different very fibers. I'll, I'll send you a video of it and get an idea. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then you can kind of mold it to which fibers you want to work in, in yeah. for, for target really. Well, in my case, all of them, yeah. none, none, <laughs> none of them grow <laughs> at this stage. I'm thinking of going back to, uh, remember John Meadows a couple of years ago, he put up that video of the cattle prod. Yeah. He was cattle prod in his, uh, I think uh, it was Dave, was it Dave Tate or someone on the, the leg extension? The yeah, quads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I could do without my pecs. Um, what are your three top tips? Did we, finish, did we, finish? Did we not? No, I think oh, we you did. Said video. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah video. Video is the big one. Yeah. Send it to your coach. Um, which ironically is what I've just said that I'll do to Nathan as well after this call is I'll send him my video. Um, so what are your top three tips on avoiding injuries in the gym? Um number one would be load appropriate i think um either people go too low or too high in terms of their load and then when you go too high and you progress too quickly uh, and don't milk weight um oh, i like that <laughs> um you then can basically load the wrong areas so if you perform exercises that load tendons and ligaments and joints and and various different structures apart from the muscle that you're using then you're just going to get you know te- that, those type of issues um, ten, most tendon issues are load based, um, so you kind of got to watch out for how lo- how much you progress your load and how appropriate is that at that time. Yep. Two more points. Uh, um, would be uh, don't do dumb shit. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> keep to your basics and be stable. Um, find exercises that you're stable in and produce force. And don't try and do weird stuff. That- so you're not a fan of say sitting on a leg press sideways pressing it no not really no. I mean, just I'd, just I'd, sit on the damn thing normally hold yeah, the handles find an exercise that'll do the other one do the something the other way yeah 
Uh, and then the last thing is obviously just make sure that you're working within the um, the ranges that you have available. So just because it's a leg press doesn't mean you go and hit yourself in the face with your knees. Um, and it's the same with the bench press. It don't go all the way. If you're not appropriately going to your position, you'll you'll end up with loading different structures. So if you're bench pressing, you don't have to go down to your chest you're not, unless you're doing a competition. So um, for somebody looking out for that themselves, that would be if they didn't have the range, the telltale sign would be that their shoulders are rolling forwards toward the bottom of the movement. Yeah. So they should be looking out for throughout. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Or throughout. Yeah. Yeah. And on the leg press, it means uh, your back stays flat on the pad and your, your hips stay down. Stay tuned for that because we'll have a video coming for that next week. Oh, nice little plug there. <laughs> I'll edit that later. Uh, <laughs> this um, podcast will come after that video, no? No, this will be... Next Thursday. Yeah, no, because I'll do it for two weeks. So uh, next, I've already got what's planned for this Monday. So I'm, maybe it'll I'm, come before or after my uh, floor press video. Oh, you keep going on about it, don't you? Jeez. He, he's so proud because he's finally done himself a video, bless him. But I'm the keeper of the keys. So he's the keeper of the keys when it comes to the finances, which actually is a bigger deal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think I've got the short straw here. But I have all the video content on here. And he, he's done this one video he's really proud of. He's like, so uh, when are we getting that? All right, yeah, I'm just so busy at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> now that you've cleared your diary for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. Oh, right, yeah, I'll get over to you later. Um, okay, moving on. So right now, let's be honest, um, you're known as one of the best no-nonsense rejo- re- results producing PTs around at the moment. What would you attribute your track record to? probably being one of the worst clients possible in terms of myself uh, my experiences in dieting have been woeful to start with um, and understanding the process that people have to go through understanding the the lies that you can tell yourself as a client or a, or a person dieting um, really helped me kind of cut through the no nonsense type of you know lying or adherence issues to my clients and therefore it kind of you get end up producing results if you clear all the bullshit around it. Yeah, no, it's, it's true. That's, uh, are you happy for us to go into it? Like, yeah, uh, absolutely. yeah, absolutely. So, so for people that don't know, so obviously Nathan's one of our coaches, um, and we met him in London. Akash and I did, and I remember walking in one day, and I see this this kid sat on the sofa, and I think, oh, maybe the owner of the business has brought his son to work today. Like, I think, oh, who is he? Like, he looked really, you know, you, you, at the time you looked really, really young back then, didn't you? Yeah. I'm like, oh, have we got like work experience in or, or what? I'm told, no, this is a new trainer. Okay, cool. So briefly have a chat with you. You seem like a cool guy. And then um, you you were told to do a photo shoot, right? As everybody knew in the business would have to do a photo shoot. Yeah. And one of the trainers decided to take you on and talk us through it. Like, what were you doing in terms of the adherence side of things? Oh, yeah. So previous to that, I would yo-yo dieted for a long time. In my first ever diet, I was like 16. And I was like doing like a 5-2 diet where I just like eat apple turnovers and chocolate cake, rolling out of bed at 8 a.m. on a Sunday morning. It was fantastic. And I lost like 15 kilos, but it just obviously mentally screwed me in terms of setting up for a new diet or a, a, a sustainable diet. So th- this is really important, actually, for those of you that are like working with Nathan. You've seen his photos. Or you've been on the website. You've seen his photos of how he looks. Like he's been through it psychologically and physically where he wasn't in great shape, you know, in terms of body fat, like initially you weren't, you weren't blessed with the best genetics. You've had to kind of work for this and, and really it's been a mindset shift for you, hasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, when I walked in the door of that place, I was about 65 kilos and about 20% body fat. So, you know, I was, I was small and I was, you know, didn't have any self-confidence and I was, was relatively chubby and yep. no muscle at all. Um, so Combining that with like an aggressive dieting approach um, and starting a new job, it just wasn't it wasn't working for me. You know, I'd, I'd do six days of, of decent food, you know, at work, whatnot, and then just as soon as you relax, you know, you go back into the old ways of oh, I'm craving this, craving that, or oh, it won't be too bad. Um, and next minute, you know, you do calipers two weeks on, or you do your weight two weeks on, and you're like, oh, well, actually, I didn't do anything for those two weeks, and then you try and justify, and then you get the whole system of justifying then doing it again and then justifying it and doing it again. And then eight weeks later, I'm here doing my hair, shaving, shaving my chest for a photo shoot that I was clearly still fat for. Yeah. Um, and that was the first time. And, and I, after that, I think I got a lot better and it just, it was kind of, I got shamed into getting better, which I think some people need. And I was, yeah, I, I was about to ask what your trigger was. 
Well, because yeah, some, yeah. something clicked, didn't it? Like you were, yeah. Yeah. you know, you were just, you know, as we said, not adhering to the plan, you know, cheating at the weekends and so on. And then something clicked and suddenly uh, you turn it around and, you know, you did another photo shoot and you dialed it in. And not only did he dial it in for himself, he just suddenly flipped with his uh, clients as well, right? Like his results suddenly took off. Everything just took off for you. And yeah, that's, I, I, he, everything came in one. It was a case of that I realized that I was doing myself a disservice. And in, in that, through that process, I learned that my clients were probably doing much of the same stuff I was doing. Um, and through that, it got me a lot better of dealing with people, not dieting. You know, everyone knows a calorie deficit is a calorie deficit and all these various different factors within training and nutrition, obviously more in depth than others, uh, potentially. But it's still going to come down to a deer. It's still going to come down to the mindset that the person have has. I think my biggest thing was that I didn't do it the, the last time I did it with, when I was uh, dieted by Josh. Uh, I didn't do it for myself. I did it for the people that I was working with and to show that, um, I'm going to leave from the front. Yeah, exactly. And that's what it was. It was a case of, um, I'm going to be the, the most leanest dude here. And I've never had that mindset before. I've seen people have it. And now I understand it. I've never been in that position where I've done it for anyone other than myself. Yeah, it yeah. always inspires your clients. If you can show them that you can take it further than they'll ever go. Yeah. Yeah. Clients and, you know, when you're working in a facility, colleagues as well. Yeah. I mean, Commands respect, right? I mean, how, how many times have, you know, I've, I've sat with you guys before and other trainers from this, the same background and have said that, you know, you get, you've got more respect now that you got leaner. And, you know, yeah. and oh, that, yeah. that's, that's something that, you know, a guy um, said to me and pulled me into the side. We were talking about something, something other, something else about a course or whatever. And he was just like, no one's ever going to respect you until you get lean. Yeah. Uh, and it was harsh and he, he probably shouldn't have said it. Well, I'm glad he did because it kind of it spared yeah. me on. And if you haven't, if you haven't got lean, how can you empathize with your clients? And and how, yeah, and like you said, how can you command respect from other trainers if if you've never been there yourself, right? Yeah. You can you can theorize all you like, right? But there's one thing writing it down on paper, then another thing actually being in shape. Yeah. 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 I, did, I, did, I didn't understand that at all. Yeah. It's but, easy to learn the book stuff, right? It's harder to you know starve yourself basically. Yeah. And get in shape. Yeah, it's, you know, as, as Akash and I have said time and time again, like a trainer doesn't need to walk around looking like a Greek god. But the two big questions are, have they got themselves shredded at least once? And have they added a lot of muscle to their frame? Mm-hmm. Somebody's gone through that process of naturally, you know, not having great genetics and having to bust ass and add muscle to their frame. And then on top of that, they've got shredded. Straight away, you're a step ahead of most other trainers in the industry, and you're going to relate to how your clients are feeling. Clients will look up to you when they see your photos. Yeah, do you agree, Akash? Hundred percent. And if if you're looking out, if you're looking for trainers out there, they've not only got to do that, but then they've got to replicate results on other clients similar to you. Yeah, that's what makes the best trainer, I think. Absolutely. Yeah, and any tra- any trainer can. I mean, I'm not going to name names. Um, one of my clients at the moment um, that's dieting for a show, she's got her, her friend that's doing it with her and her friend has insane genetics. Like her shoulders are bigger than mine. And uh, at this point, she'd only been training like three months. You know, you just get those freaks that have just got, kind of like Nathan actually, you know, the round muscle belly look. Well, this is a female and she has that. These big like lateral delts, awesome back, uh, really new to training, quad sweep. And uh, she's being prepped by a girl that, has never even got in shape. You know, she stood on stage, uh, fat, I'm going to be blunt here, and didn't get anywhere at the show. Three weeks after the show, the promoters felt bad for her and sent her a trophy through the post to say, uh, basically, like, thanks for competing. Um, I can't remember what the name of the award was. It was, like, um, best, like, social media presence. or It was some, like, <laughs> basically, she, she looked like a bag of shit on stage. Um, but she's prepping this girl that's got these awesome genetics. And no matter what you do, when you've got a client like that, you're going to get a result. You can't not. So the point that Akash is making, and I've gone off on a bit of a tangent here and ranted <laughs> because it's frustrating is, you know, if you don't have amazing genetics, if you have average genetics, you need to look for coaches that have also got people with average genetics in shape, added muscle to them, got them leaner, rather than just cherry picked those clients that have got the, the great genetics, you know, uh, great glutes really lean or a dude with massive arms and muscle bellies anyone can get a result with that yeah is that the point you're making akash a yeah. bit more subtle than 
<laughs> you sound a bit fired up today. <laughs> yeah, you're charged, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, I took um, some stampede stim earlier. Really? So I'm like, yeah, I'm jacked up on like caffeine, and yeah, I was feeling quite tired lately. So uh, I thought I'd pet myself up the podcast with that. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm talking 100 miles an hour. Um, That's why your brain's firing on all cylinders today. Right? Yeah, yes. Yeah, <laughs> so unlo- you've unlocked all these uh, brain waves. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I've been listening to that intelligence music that I sent to you. Oh, <laughs> man, that, stuff's, that stuff's so good. It's great, isn't it? Oh, it's like a. It's very subtle. It kind of. It, it kind of um, blends. It's weird. It's weird, isn't it? Your head, right? Yeah, it's, it's odd, but uh, it's it's working. I'm getting work done. Yeah, which will keep yeah. you happy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, what should we go with next? Let's go for uh, fat loss plateaus. Give us your uh, three favorite uh, strategies. For busting through a fat loss plateau, um, first one would be recheck your adherence, recheck what you're eating, and recheck your steps and cardio, and ensure that you're not eating any extra things that you're just not supposed to be. You know, fat loss yep. ge- generally will be linear in a sense if you're monitoring different variables. Um, so it's always good to go back and check, even if you aren't wrong. It's good to go and check quite often. Um, whether you know you've added tomato ketchup here, there, and everywhere, or the classic, you know, Warden's Farm marshmallow dip on a Tuesday night, that is just is full of rubbish and probably isn't calorie free. Um, <laughs> I've been there. Um, <laughs> See, speaks from experience. Yeah, there you go. It's, it's, it's Thursday as well. Um, <laughs> um, I'd probably say that's number one. Uh, number two is always going to be, um, if in doubt, work harder. Yep. Now you could go down the whole route of looking at, you know, the biochemical differences and, and whatever training volume, stress, hormone manipulation, blah blah blah. So what blah, do you blah. mean by biomechanic biochemical differences? Oh, just like you know, stress induced stuff. You know, the HP oh, okay. axis, like thyroid and um, okay, like all the different variances. Um, but you could just work harder if it's a short stint, um, and whether it's more steps, more cardio, decreased calories, you know, kind of grind a little or the hashtag Vagella grind. Uh, would be more appropriate here yeah um and then third one would be to look at the the differences and maybe you know it might not be fat loss but it might be our tracking variables maybe you know skewed <laughs> whether it's stress um sleep um, water hydration all these different types of things can, can cut digestion uh, gut health can all have an impact on fat loss um in a sense whether it's met- your metrics being skewed or actual fat loss um, so they would be probably definitely my top three. So to summarize, in most cases, people aren't being adherent. And yeah, the, the little things add up. Yeah, and secondly is work harder. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, keep it nice and simple. Yeah. In most cases, it's going to be one of those two, right? Yeah, yeah. Most yeah. if it's you know it's a short like a twelve week transformation or uh, you know sixteen week prep or twenty week prep, there's there's going to be time after that to look at how how your bloods are how your hormones are how your rest of the stuff is but at, at that moment in time you just have to get shit done what's your thoughts on uh, people doing refeeds and cheat meals and things like that uh it's great for psycho- psychological value um yeah. and whether it's like you know filling up the tank in terms of uh, glycogen refuel but they're not they're not gonna be great if you're trying to really diet down because yeah. if you have that food unless you're really really strict you're going to go off the walls at some point, maybe two, three days afterwards, because your hunger is going to be rife. You're going to be, you know, back to your fish and greens or your, your chicken, broccoli and sweet potato. And then you're just going to be hating life because of all the Ben and Jerry's you've been eating at the weekend to have a refeed. Um, and then it's much harder to stick to. Yeah. Um, I think really refeeds by and large, like they're, they're most applicable to genuine physique athletes that are ahead of target, genuinely like depleted of glycogen don't have much fat to lose that's where i think it, physiologically it has its biggest effect i mean i've probably only ever given <clears throat> three refeeds in in a scheduled a scheduled thing for my clients and and three of them were for the, the same guy and that was matt when i was prepping him for his uh contest prep yeah and uh, i said to him we're going to get you ready early and four weeks out he was ready um so we gave him uh, refeeds of like a thousand grams carbs and he still dropped weight so it was like you know, yeah. I don't have any refeeds. Yeah, you weren't you weren't ready. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, one time he said to me, "Oh, we're going to push your carbs up for a refeed." So how much is going to go up? He's like two hundred eighty grams. <laughs> that was your refeed. Damn, <laughs> that's good. <I> don't know. <laughs> 
So um, what's next for you in terms of uh, physique wise? Like, uh, are you going to do another photo shoot? Are you still contemplating the idea of competing or is it low on the priorities right now? It's massive low on the priorities now. Um, since coming back from Dubai, um, it's a case of I've actually got a social life, um, <laughs> which is, you know, it's unheard of in the, in the fitness industry. It's nice. I'm going out like a couple of times a week, socializing with friends and, um, you know, my other half. Um, so it's a case of we're we're just enjoying what we're doing and then I'm training three or four times a week, you know, nothing major. I'm not getting obsessed. I'm not getting I'm probably going the opposite way and I'm not really just just moving basically. Uh-huh. Um, what holidays? What holidays you got booked? Anything lined up? Oh yeah, I'm going back to Dubai. Um in about in that seven weeks, so I am doing a little bit of mini diet just to obviously be be decent for uh, the beach, but you know nothing major. We go okay. to Dubai, probably a big holiday at the end of the year. Uh, yeah, to yeah. Kind of really re- refresh. What well, do you do I, if you're, oh no, I was going to say you and I are potentially going to be hitting Vegas for a little weekend. <laughs> yes. Uh, in May, so uh, if we want to make it a team <laughs> team R and T thing, then uh, Nathan's welcome to join for the the Vegas part of it. Yeah. <laughs> and for those of you who don't know, Nathan and I did Vegas last year. And uh, aside from the first day, I think it was a pretty fun trip. Yeah, it was great. I mean, we had one um, credit card between all of us. It was, it was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, for, the, for those of you that are interested, uh, we, we went to Vegas. I kept banging on to, uh, to Nathan and Tarek, oh, you know, we've got to get a day bed when we go to Wet Republic. We've got to get a day bed. And they're like, oh, you know, I don't know. It's, you know, it's a lot of money. There's me saying, come on, it's Vegas. Like, you've got to go all out. So we get this day bed and loving life. Nathan's ordering bottles of vodka that we don't need at five hundred dollars, <laughs> at five hundred dollars each each bottle. And he's like, "Yeah, I got another one." And his girls just sat drinking it all. <laughs> anyway, we're having a great time, and uh, we we finish the day. We go to head over to the bed, and all of our stuff is stolen. <laughs> all that is left over is Tarek's passport. Yeah. But mine and Nathan's uh, driving licenses are stolen. Our phones are stolen. Uh, bank cards, you name it. Um, we then had like a 40 minute waddle in silence in the <laughs> hotel lobby, which gave me blisters on the inside of my thighs when my swim shorts were chafing from <laughs> having been in the pool all day. You know, the, do you remember like the hotel gate lent us like $20 to get a taxi back to the hotel? Yep. The, ta- it, the meter hit $20 and he dropped us off another like <laughs> 50 meters away. That oh, was a nightmare. Yep. Um, and then we walked in on uh we came back after one of the nights do you remember yeah Tarek, we opened the, the yeah we opened we opened the hotel door if Tarek's listened to this and just smell this like this dairy smell like <laughs> sour like dairy and i look at nathan and i'm like the fuck is that and then we see Tarek like comatose <laughs> with his laptop half open covered in greek yogurt <laughs> 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 he, he got he got bored halfway through the night decided to leave and just go get food. <laughs> so Nathan and I are searching for him in this club in Omnia. Couldn't find him anywhere. And then, yeah, we, we turn up at the hotel room, God knows what time. And there's, there's Tariq, semi-naked, covered in Greek yogurt. <laughs> Lovely. So, um, yeah, so roll on Vegas in May. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably with more money and more cards next time. Yeah, 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 definitely, yeah. Won't be, uh, won't be leaving them in the drawers of the day bed, that's for sure. <laughs> that was a mistake. Yeah. Akash, anything else that you want to add to this one? Well, I wasn't in Vegas, so I can't add to that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the podcast. <laughs> Before we wrap up. No, we'll wrap up. Um, you can follow us on uh, Instagram. <laughs> so, so, so before, before we go ahead, Nath, do you, do you hear every week about me commenting about <laughs> Akash getting up close to the screen? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> he just did it there. <laughs> Carry on. Okay, to wrap up, you can follow us on Instagram at rnt underscore fitness or at Akash Fogella or at Adam Haley one Or you can visit our website, www.rntfitness.co.uk. And if you want to follow Nathan along, it's at Nathan Johnson with three ends at the end. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. You've yeah. done your homework, haven't you? We'll, uh, <laughs> we'll put those in the show notes. Very good. Nicely done. Thanks for your time, Nathan. No problem. It's a pleasure as always, boys. Awesome. Right. Speak to you soon. Speak to you soon. Wait.